Uh, my name is Tam Wynn. I'm a vascular surgeon. I work at MD Anderson Cancer Center here in uh, town. And uh, I'm going to give you two talks. The first one is now on visceral artery aneurysm, which is even less common than acute or chronic mesenteric ischemia. Check my slide. Okay, so I have no disclosure. Um, so visceral artery aneurysm disease, and I think you've had a talk about this this morning already, so it's a little bit repetitive, but that's how we remember things is repetition. So the incidence is very rare, um, and most of these patients present um, with no symptoms. The um, patients are usually referred to us because of an incident finding on imaging. The pathogenesis uh, remains relatively uh, not well described. And the importance of visceral artery aneurysm is really to recognize them because when they present with a rupture, then the mortality rate um, remains very high. Management of visceral artery aneurysm is like most things in vascular surgery, um, surveillance if they're small, um, endovascular options and uh, surgical options um, are both um, pretty, much, pretty much comparable. Now this is a distribution of visceral artery aneurysm. The most common type is splenic artery aneurysm, 60% of the time. Second most common involve the hepatic artery and then celiac and then the other um, smaller arteries. Now like I mentioned, the um, etiology of um, visceral artery aneurysm remains kind of um, not very well defined, but typically we classify them into true aneurysm versus pseudoaneurysm. And the true aneurysm are typically acquired um, because of um, thought to be underlying medial degeneration. There's uh, people with connective tissue disorder that are more predisposed to developing um, visceral artery aneurysm. And then people who present with um, sort of spontaneous dissection can uh, develop uh, the the development can develop um, true aneurysms in uh, later uh, time. And then the pseudoaneurysm are probably more common. Um, these are due to either traumatic, um, whether blunt or um, penetrating. Um, infectious cause of pseudoaneurysm, you also got to remember, um, and these can be post-operative pseudoaneurysm as well. So let's talk about the most common type of visceral artery aneurysm. Splenic artery aneurysm, 60% of all of them. Prevalence is low, less than 1%. Um, most of these, or some of these may have associated other visceral artery aneurysm, and about 14% of these have associated renal artery aneurysm. Um, in this particular type of visceral artery aneurysm, it's more common in women than men. Um, the underlying etiology is thought to be medial fibrodysplasia. Um, and it's thought that if you carry more, um, many children, you're more at risk for it, and people with portal hypertension are also at um, higher risk of uh, developing splenic artery aneurysm. And truly, these are found incidentally most of the time, and only a small number of them will rupture, but when they do rupture, um, the mortality, mortality rate is uh, fairly high. So what, is, uh, what are the indications to treat splenic artery aneurysm? Um, I think Anybody who has symptomatic um, visceral artery aneurysm, uh, th that uh, is an indication for treatment. I must tell you, I've been in um, this field now for almost 20 years, and I have yet met a um, person with true symptomatic um, artery aneurysm. Um, in any case, it is indicated if you are a childbearing woman with a splenic artery aneurysm that's greater than two centimeter, but it, because it is well reported that pregnancy can lead to a higher risk of rupture. Um, the other indication for repairing small splenic artery aneurysm in people with uh, orthotopic liver transplant, the risk of rupture is slightly higher in those patients. And then I think most people agree that you only consider operating on these if they're asymptomatic in people who have splenic artery aneurysm greater than three centimeters. So that's the basic treatment is really you want to try and preserve the spleen um, and I think there's um, much um, more splenic artery aneurysm being treated in the endovascular way than open surgery, uh, but in both cases, you want to try and preserve the uh, splenic artery and uh, hence preserve the spleen. So let's take a look at a couple of ways to uh, coil the splenic artery aneurysm. Um, typically, if you have a saccular aneurysm with a long neck, then that's sort of the sort of the best um, type of uh, aneurysm to fix with um, coil. You can see this uh, splenic artery aneurysm with the neck and it's very saccular, so you can shove a lot of uh, coil into it. The uh, other way to um, 
try and preserve the splenic artery in people with splenic artery aneurysm is to put in a cover stent graft. Um, and I don't have the pre-procedure uh, CT to show you, but this is a patient who uh, five years after we excluded her splenic artery aneurysm, which was greater than three centimeters at the time, this is a five-year follow-up of a cover stent graft that we place in the uh, splenic artery. And you can see the challenge of splenic artery aneurysm intervention is the tortuosity of it. And you can imagine navigating a sheet into the, the tor torturous splenic artery may be uh, challenging. Uh, but it is possible, and uh, this patient had uh, successful stent graft placement. This is another case, um, another example of a splenic artery aneurysm in a patient who um, had um, pancreatic cancer, and this uh, huge um, aneurysm here, you can see of the spleen, you can see here this uh, biliary stent. And so because this patient's gonna have a Whipple procedure at the same time, we thought, hmm, maybe we could just fix everything at the same time. Or alternatively, you know, to lessen the, the extensive surgery, we were thinking maybe we can uh, put a, a cover stent or a coil or something. And we did attempt to uh, put a stent graft, and I think I must have been sleep deprived or been on some drug or something, because there is no way you can put a, you know, cross this lesion and put a cover stent graft. Um, so we did do an arteriogram to sort of see whether we can um, sort of try and put a coil or a stent grab, but we were not able to do so. So the patient did end up having um, the Whipple procedure and open repair of the splenic artery aneurysm with the primary end-to-end -end reconstruction. And we uh, were able to preserve the spleen. Now the other, um, most, second most common type of visceral artery aneurysm involves the hepatic artery. And it involves the uh, common hepatic artery um, more often than the remaining branches. And about 80% of all hepatic artery aneurysm are extra hepatic. And again, these uh, will have associated other visceral artery aneurysm in about a third of the time. Um, these tend to happen in older people. And uh, this one involves more men than women. Um, now, when you have a big hepatic artery aneurysm, it can sort of press on the bile duct and cause jaundice. And it can also rupture into the biliary tree and cause hemobilia, uh, what they term Quinky's triad. But otherwise, these are typically, again, found incidental on CT imaging. Um, and uh, aneurysm of the hepatic artery, you know, people talk about indication for treatment is greater than two centimeter in most of the textbook. I have tended to be more conservative, to be honest with you. Um, I have sort of uh, followed a number of these patients. And uh, really, I have not really had one that had rupture on surveillance. So in my own personal um, practice, I, I really don't treat them until it really is get above three centimeters or even bigger than that, um, and only if they are surg good surgical candidates. Pseudoaneurysm is probably more common in, in hepatic artery than the true aneurysm. Um, and the treatment, again, open versus endovascular. Um, let's take a look. So this is a, a common hepatic artery aneurysm in a patient who had colon cancer. And you can see the um, common hepatic artery with the intramural thrombus on the CT there. And um, so he had colon cancer, so we were actually gonna try and do both at the same time and uh, use a vein graft to replace the uh, hepatic artery. Um, and so this is the uh, pre-sagittal view of the uh, common hepatic artery um, aneurysm before we fix it, and this is the vein graft um, reconstruction from the um, um, sort of end of the celiac artery here to the uh, hepatic artery there, distal anastomosis somewhere there. Um, this is another example of a 74-year-old man with melanoma um, on systemic treatment, and he was found to have an incidental hepatic artery aneurysm. And here you could sort of see that aneurysm right there. That's next to the portal vein, and this is um, the celiac artery, that's the splenic coming off, and this is the common hepatic. So that likely involves the uh, right hepatic artery. And indeed, it was um, right hepatic artery on this other slide. And this is the coronal view. You can see the left hepatic artery going up there, and the aneurysm is in the distal right hepatic artery. So this one measure almost three centimeters. Um, and so we opted to uh, go ahead and fix that one because we were worried he, some of the chemotherapy can lead to uh, higher blood pressure or hypertension in some of the 
Um, oncologists are worried about the high risk of rupture when a patient undergoes chemotherapy. And this one was just, just, just under three centimeters, I believe. So we went ahead and fixed that one. Um, I actually borrowed this from my uh, colleague, the interventional radiologist, who actually did this case. And here you can see the selective view um, of the uh, very distal part of the right hepatic artery with that aneurysm. So when you coil or when you occlude these aneurysms, you need to just not only close off the the feeding artery, but you also need to close off the, what we call the outflow artery on these, just like when you do AVM malformation. So here you can see the coil that we put beyond the uh, aneurysm. Um, and so this is the outflow artery being coiled, and this is the inflow artery being coiled. Before we coil these, we actually inject the uh, student, the, pardon me, the we injected the aneurysm with uh, liquid glue to uh, completely obliterate the aneurysm sac as well. And then we closed off the um, inflow artery. So this is uh, his CT scan six months post embolization. You can sort of see a lot of artifact from, uh, from the coils, um, but essentially the um, aneurysm has been effectively um, excluded. This is an example of a hepatic artery pseudoaneurysm post Whipple procedure. You can sort of see a um, big sort of a blush here. And um, so the patient is post-op, and um, the best way to treat these pseudoaneurysm post-op is uh, really either um, coil it if the hole is small or uh, put a cover stand if the hole is big. And so this is um, just a selective arteriogram of the um, hepatic artery, and you can sort of see the hole is probably right at the bifurcation of the right and the left hepatic artery in the common hepatic artery um, still, and we put coils, and you can see the flow there without that blush um, on the pre-imaging. So the third most common visceral artery aneurysm is, uh, the, uh, involves the SMA. Um, it, um, again, we usually don't fix these unless it gets above three centimeters. Uh, most of these are not symptomatic. Uh, most of these are found incidentally. In the treatment, if you have a good proximal and distal neck, then you can try and put a uh, um, cover stent. And Dr. Um, Bavari has shown you a couple of ways of doing that for occlusive disease, and it's the same principle for aneurysm. So some of these um, aneurysm form over time after an acute dissection. And um, at um, Anderson, I get to do this, Ash, I get to see the um, spontaneous SMA dissection not infrequently. Maybe I see about maybe one or two um, every three, four months or so. And some of the chemotherapy agents actually can cause, um, for not yet known mechanism, can cause acute dissection of the SMA and celiac. And so here I'm going to show you a, um, an example of SMA dissection. You can sort of see the dissection right there and how the SMA is kind of dilated. And I think the natural history of these is that most of them don't heal. Um, and, and some of them may grow to become of significant size, and you may need to uh, fix that. Uh, but most of them do not heal in the sense that you always will see that um, internal flap. Now, this is a, um, an example of a SMA pseudoanism after a Whipple procedure. And so how to fix this one? So he's about, this patient is about maybe, say, seven to 10 days post-op and um, is kind of uh, dropping his or her hemoglobin. And you can see the pseudoanism right there. And this is kind of a mess to go back in. You would think when you know you were just in there, we can go back in and just fix it. Um, but sometimes these can be quite messy. And one, we reconstruct, you know, if you, ever seen a Whipple, how you reconstruct the bile duct and the, the intestinal conduit, um, it's actually hard to get into that SMA area to um, fix it in an open fashion. So um, endovascular, endovascular um, repair is actually better for those post-op pseudoanism, and you can see it here. And this one, we went from um, anti-grade fashion from the brachial down. You can see the pseudoanism there. And um, so we were able to stent the pseudoanism using a cover stent. This is before we had the uh, balloon expandable stent. Um, and you can see there's a lot of spasm 
Um, so the SMA is relatively small, right? Um, so we think we put in like a five or a six centimeter, uh, six millimeters um, diameter cover stent. Do you prefer balloon expandable stent for this position, you think, Char? I think more the origin, this one, I think assembly planning will reduce the time. So you reserve the balloon expandable one for the ones that you want to be more accurate, the one that needs more radial force or something like that. Yeah, because the, um, the self-expandable one are a little bit more flexible, um, I believe. I haven't actually used a lot of balloon expandable cover stent just yet. Anyways, finally, the um, um, last type of aneurysm I'm going to talk about is the celiac artery aneurysm. This is not very common. Again, asymptomatic. Um, and wouldn't treat them unless it gets above two or three centimeters. They also associate with the dissection. You can see a dissection here in this um, CT. And um, other things you must remember for your maybe board exam later on years from now, um, any sort of branches of the SMA or IMA or celiac can, can form aneurysm. Um, and the reason why you need to remember it is because it can happen um, this is a, an example of a, um, you know, I, I must say, I don't know exactly whether this is a gastroduodenal or pancreaticoduodenal um, aneurysm, but you got to follow those things from uh, the video in order to really figure out where that um, aneurysm is coming from. Lastly, I want to show you a, a study from uh, about 10 or so years ago, about the management, comparing the management of aneurysms between um, surgical open way versus endovascular um, exclusion of these uh, visceral artery aneurysm. They had about 59 cases, 35 were endovascular and 24 were open. And um, the only thing that came out as significant was that um, more people who had cancer um, had undergone endovascular treatment versus uh, less people with cancer um, actually had open um, treatment. And um, splenic artery aneurysm, again, is the most common type in, the, in this series. Um, the uh, hepatic artery type of aneurysms tended to be pseudoaneurysm rather than, rather than true aneurysm, and most of the pseudoaneurysm were repair endovascularly. Bottom line is there was no significant difference between the two ways of treating aneurysms of the visceral artery, whether it's open or endovascular in terms of morbidity, uh, but certainly patients stayed at much longer in the hospital than uh, uh, when they had open surgery compared to endovascular treatment. Um, the length of stay was much, much less. This is a slide from a recent um, article by Dr. Serac, um, now from uh, Yale, I think he is at. Um, showing the trend, and this is just like Char would show you the trend in endovascular treatment for occlusive disease. You have the same trend in endovascular treatment for visceral artery aneurysm. Um, you can see in blue is the endovascular treatment for visceral artery aneurysm going up, whereas open repair is kind of coming down. Overall, there is an increase in the uh, treatment of these, and I think that's just because we're doing more and more imaging for everything, um, so we're finding more and more of them. But just remember, in summary, visceral artery aneurysms are rare, um, and really, they, they don't rupture until it gets big. And big for me, it's three centimeter above. For your OR exam, maybe two centimeter for the hepatic and um, others. But for people with splenic artery aneurysm in pregnant women, you can treat them when it's a little bit smaller, like two centimeters. Um, we need to treat all acute pseudoaneurysm, of course, because pseudoaneurysms are typically a hole in the artery and not really an aneurysm. So you gotta, you gotta exclude those. And that ends my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.